And then he was like, you know, if you don't give me your keys, I swear I'll shoot you. And I said, I'm sorry, man. I just can't give you my car. I'm sorry. I'll help you out how I can, but I can't give you my car. Let go of me and step back about two feet. I felt the gun back on my knee and he pulled the trigger. Listen, gang, Lucky Gunner has both fantastic content and great prices on ammo. Enjoy the convenience of online purchase and crazy fast shipping. Experience why Lucky Gunner is one of our favorite spots on the Gunternet. Go to get-ass.com forward slash Lucky Gunner. And while you're there, check out MagTech Ammunition. MagTech is the exclusive range ammo for the active self-protection team, and we are grateful for their commitment to quality and support. You can buy MagTech ammo at the Lucky Gunner link. Remember to tell them both that the Ask Podcast sent you. Just a heads up, gang. This episode, once again, uh, with any luck, if we can coordinate it, will also be on the main channel. Our guest today, uh, his defensive encounter, such as it was, uh, was caught on tape. And John will be breaking that down over on the Active Cell Protection main channel. So go check that out and, uh, and enjoy. All right, folks. Welcome back to the Active Cell Protection Podcast. I am your host, once again, Mike Williver, your favorite former Fed with us today, a uh, new friend of mine, Kevin Cooper. Kevin is a resident of Florida, originally from Oklahoma. Uh, he has no kids and is single. So ladies, you heard it here first. Kevin is uh, on the market, as it were. Uh, so Kevin, uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, someone reached out to me and told me about your story in particular. We try to cover every angle of, of self-defense that we can here, not just the success story. Sometimes things go poorly. And there's no resolution. Sometimes you, people get injured and there's no justice in the world, as it seems like. Uh, we want to cover everything so that people out there who are listening can hopefully learn a lesson and and maybe avoid finding themselves in the same position. Of course, listening to Kevin's case, sometimes you can do everything right and bad things still happen, um, despite being cautious and you know being aware of your surroundings. So, uh, Kevin, first of all, where, where are you? You're from Oklahoma originally. What part of Oklahoma are you from? Um, I'm west of Tulsa, Creek County, kind of suburb of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right on. I got a good friend there, Warren Wilson. He's a police officer in that area. Um, speaks highly Great. of awesome. that general vicinity. Uh, a lot of good people. It's God's country. Uh, you're in Florida now. Can I ask what kind of work you do? I work in the convention, convention industry, um, pretty much assemblies and um, trade shows, building them up, putting the audiovisual and tear them down when they leave. Well, very interesting. I've never met someone who did that. That's interesting. I've been to a number of conventions and I always wonder who the, besides the individual vendors, I always wonder who the people are behind the scenes. I didn't realize that was a, that was an industry. Very cool. Um, it, as it turns out you were in, uh, Atlanta. You want to tell us when this happened? It happened in the middle of December last year. December okay. 11th was the day of the incident. So you were visiting uh, Atlanta for work for a convention at the time. Um, can you tell us before we get started about the actual incident? Do you have any um, sort of history of self defense training, firearms training, martial arts, anything like that? I do not. I okay. went to a, um, a firearms um, class that was held put on by a local or a retired sheriff's deputy in the county I live in, and uh, it was only for like a few hours, and I didn't get a whole lot out of it. Yeah, that's unfortunately, but that's frequently the case. Unfortunately. Um, so would you say that you are more or less uh, aware of your surroundings and cautious about where you are and where you go and what you do, maybe more than the average person? I am now. Okay. That's a good point. So prior to this, would you say you were at least aware of, you know, of your own safety? You weren't uh, sort of a head in the clouds person who wasn't aware of their surroundings? Not so much. I mean, on that particular evening, and I realized I needed gas, I passed a couple of gas stations where I could have stopped, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't, you know, it's after dark, and I don't know the neighborhood, and, you know, I'm looking for some place that looks less, uh, more crowded. Right. More people, you know, more people there, well lit. Well lit, that sort of thing, yeah, exactly. Uh, and would you say the, the place you pulled up to was in a, I mean, you know, you're not super familiar with Atlanta, would you say it was a good area, an okay area? It wasn't, didn't seem like a high crime area or run it down was, or anything? <clears throat> it was not a good area. It was downtown Atlanta, for instance. Uh, I was staying in the bed and breakfast that somebody had rented for me on my behalf, and it looked great on the pictures online and such, you know, when people rented out, but it was, the street it was on was, not lit the homes on either side and across were boarded up the windows were uh, bullet ridden um it was a great b and b but not in a good area you know this and, you won't understand this joke but i know someone who will our, our ceo stephanie widener um she books 
our Airbnbs when we go on various for active self protection events. And um, she has a knack for finding ones like the one you described, where it's uh, sketchy or generally speaking, not somewhere you'd want to stay or uh, you know or leave your valuables unguarded. So, on her behalf, you know, you can't you can only go from the pictures online. That's right. That looks nice. I would have gotten it myself. Yeah, yeah, it's t- it's tough. I mean, the place could be nice inside, but the outside's another story potentially. So Very much. Uh, had, had you been done for, it was, it was evening, early evening, right? You, have you done for work for the day? You had finished doing what you're doing for the convention? I had, I had, I got out of work about 6 PM, uh, on December 11th that evening. And, um, my roommates and I decided, uh, the people I was staying with in the Airbnb decided we were going to stop off and, um, um, uh, get something to eat. So we did. And after dinner, we all had drove our, you know, we drove there separately. We all went back, and that's when I'm like, yeah, I should probably get gas tonight since I have to be at work at 6 a.m. It'd be easier tonight than it will be in the morning. That was my decision. Right. So you had um, to be back at the convention center in the morning to do whatever it is you had to do? At 6 a.m. Okay. So you said you passed a couple of gas stations, so you settled on this one. It was the it was the least bad gas station, you know, in between where you were going and your uh, where you were coming from, and and the Airbnb. So you you pull in there. I've seen the video, and uh, it looks you know looks like a gas station. Looks like it's fairly well lit. There didn't appear to be a lot of people. There was people there milling around. So you pull up to the pump. You get out. You're doing your business, and and walk us through what happened there. Oh, I um, I said. I drove up into it. It was very well lit. There's at least six to eight other vehicles there. I saw people. It just didn't look threatening to me at all. So I pulled up in there and I got gas. And um, um, I, when I finished, the machine didn't have any paper in it for the receipt. So for some reason, I threw my cell phone into my front seat, locked the car, and turned to walk into the building to get the receipt. And I was probably two, three steps from the vehicle as the video shows, and that young man was up on me. So the receipt, I assume, was required because it was a work-related expense, otherwise you wouldn't have cared about the receipt? Of course. Okay. Of course. So uh, for people who haven't seen the video yet, it will be on the main channel. Um, The the, the camera is facing outward from, it looks like, the roof or the upper area of the structure, and it's facing out towards all the gas bays. You're on the right. You turn to walk towards the building, and when when did you know there was someone um, uh, accosting you? Did you hear something? Uh, did he say something? Or what, what gave you the impression somebody was trying to get your attention? Uh, as I said, I probably wasn't a step or two from the back of my vehicle walking back towards the building. And somebody bum rushed on me and put something in the back of my knee and said, give me your car keys or I'll shoot your Mm-hmm. Shoot you. And um, my first thought is silly is that it was somebody I knew messing around playing a game. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, it's funny. We talk, we talk about that all the time. Uh, you know, I just recently talked to some guys, some uh, active shooter response guys talking about, you know, kids in school and they hear shots being fired. You know, their first thought is to try to rationalize it like, oh, maybe that's fireworks or maybe it's, you know, something other than what it is. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty normal reaction is to try to normalize and rationalize things like, oh, this maybe this was one of the guys I had dinner with and he's, you know, happened to stop at the same gas station and he's messing with me. If you can remember, was that really what you thought or was your brain trying to make something normal out of something that was clearly not? Well, um, it happened very fast. Right. My, um, I had to process a lot. And like I said, my very first thought was uh, – Oh man, these guys or someone I knew just where my head went. Mm-hmm. And then when he repeated himself and he pushed uh, something in the back of my knee and I could look back and see it was wrapped in carpet or rug or something. Mm-hmm. It could have been a pole for a pipe or something for all I know, but it turned out it was a gun. And he, you know, demanded my car keys. And uh, first thing I thought was I have to be at work at 6 a.m. Well, I can't give this guy my car. Right. This is this so is your I, car, not a rental or a company car. Oh, no, sorry, it was mine. Okay. So he he demands your keys. You turn around, you see something his hand wrapped in something. Did it before you were actually shot? Did it occur to you there might be a gun underneath all that? Um, I want to say it did because I was trying to rationalize with him and telling him, you know, I can give you you know, a ride. 
but I can't give you my car. I just can't give you my car. So I'm going to say probably, yes, I probably it's pretty soon. Hey, you know, let's not find out what that really is. Assume it is a gun appeal to his, you know, good nature. Yeah. Unfortunately he probably didn't have a lot of good nature. And now for folks who can't see, he's shaking his head. Like I wish I had, you know, I wish I'd have thought differently. So do, do you, do you think if you'd have just handed him your keys, he would have just taken off and not assaulted you? Or what do you think might've happened? And it's hard to say. Um, that's a call that I, haven't really thought a whole lot about. I do know the officers in Atlanta told me they felt that he probably would have shot me anyway. So he says, give me your keys. He reiterates, give me your keys. And did you say to him out loud, I can't give you my keys. Maybe I'll give you a ride with those words you actually said, or were you thinking that? Absolutely. No, I didn't think that I said that. Okay. So you said, I can't give you my car. I'll give you a ride. What happens next? And then he was like, you know, if you don't give me your keys, I swear I'll shoot you. And I said, I'm sorry, man. I just can't give you my car. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll do something. I'll help you out how I can, but I can't give you my car. And he's, you know, he let go of me and stepped back about two feet. And I, for some reason, I kind of felt like, you know, it was over. And then I felt him shoot, you know, I felt the gun back on my knee and he pulled the trigger. So he actually put the muzzle of the gun against your leg and pulled the trigger? He did. Interesting. I wonder why he didn't shoot you from maybe he wanted to make sure he hit you. I mean, I, I guess, I don't want to give anyone the benefit that out doesn't deserve it, but I guess maybe he was trying to not kill you while still getting your keys? I mean, I don't know. That's a possibility. Is that something you think might have been the case? You want the truth of the matter? I've uh, kept, I've played this back in my head a hundred times on what I should have, could have, you know, what I should have done as opposed to what I did. I just keep coming to the same conclusion. He seemed scared to death himself. I think he, he was young. I think he, I believe it was gang related and i get that from you know the cops uh discussions with the police officers and such in the area i was in they brought it up you know i think you know that's you know as opposed to somebody just rolling up on me and say hey there's a clown let's take his car i, I drive a 2011 hyundai elantra that silver looks like every other elantra on the road mm -hmm. it's not unique in any way so you think perhaps this was a peer pressure gang initiation kind of a situation well, that's kind of the most, um, as far as why me, answering all the questions, why me, uh, excuse I can come up with, because while I was at the pump getting gas, while I was pumping the gas, I saw the vehicle pull to the other side of the pump. And they stopped. They didn't get out. They just drove away. But they didn't pay any attention. They, cause I don't pay it, you know, even where I live in the daytime. I usually don't pay attention or didn't pay attention to what's going on on the other side of the pump for me because, you know, not to walk through life with tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. But believe me, <laughs> I see everything that stirs now. Right. So, you know, I have a wake up call. And anyway, I never saw them drive up. You see in the video where they drive up and they stop. I didn't see that because I wasn't paying attention to them. I was thinking about getting that receipt and leaving on the bed. You know, we talk a lot on this channel about public spaces, we call transitional spaces, you know, that's the place between walking out of a store to your car or from your house to your car or vice versa. And, you know, I, you know now better than anyone that a, a gas station is a huge transitional space. A lot of people doing a lot of things. And, and it's it's a place that um, even before I retired from law enforcement, I don't know that I paid that much as much attention to my surroundings as I do now after spending a year working for active self-protection and watching all these videos of people being uh, snuck up on and or assaulted in a, in a place like a gas station. In fact, I stopped at a gas station in Tucson. Tucson, parts of Tucson are pretty rough. And I stopped at a gas station at a certain intersection. And uh, I looked around and there was there was uh, interesting characters in every direction. So I, I, I don't think I looked down at the, ha at the pump or the handle one time while I was fueling up. So he pulls a trick. Actually, let me digress for one moment. So you said the kid seems scared. You said kid or young person. If you had to take a wild guess, how old would you say he was? I would guess he was like between 19, 22 years old. Okay. Young enough. Again, old enough to know he better. He had a uh, math, right? Um, he had a, he wasn't the driver of the vehicle. He was a passenger. And um, um, he had a hoodie on and a mask. And I could tell he was black and, you know, male. And that was about really all I could really see. Right. 
So no distinguishing characteristics to tell the police or anything like that? No, just his height and his very vague description. Yeah. Because that's all I could give him. Yeah, it's like being in Texas and saying, we're looking for a guy with a cowboy hat and boots. You know, go find him. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're shot now, um, shot in the back of the knee. First of all, how long does it take you to realize you've been shot? Is it instantaneous? Is it? Is there any delay in between it? Did you hear the shot? Did you feel the pain immediately? Or how did that go down, if you can remember? I did. And there was, I would say, a slight delay. It almost felt like somebody snuck up on me and put a hot fireplace poker into the back of my knee. Uh-huh. But, you know, and then it was like, oh, you shot me. Oh, I got to get help. And I... um you can see in the video where he jumped in the vehicle and drove away. I walked back towards the building, took like one or two steps, and then, you know, fell, couldn't step on the right knee, clearly. And the blood started running out, and um, there was nobody around after that gunshot. All those people I saw before were gone, mm-hmm. of course. So you're, you're bleeding, would you say you're bleeding pretty badly from your leg? Oh, uh, quite a bit. I lost a lot of blood. Yeah, it looked like it in the video. I, I couldn't tell exactly, but it looked like you were, you were bleeding pretty good. A lot of blood. What goes through your mind at this point? I'm sure you're thinking, I left my cell phone in the car and I can't walk. Helpless. Mm. Helpless. Stupid. Thinking about, oh, I left my phone in the car. Not thinking about, hey, why didn't you just you know, do this in the daytime? Just, I got to yell for help and there's nobody around. And so how long? I was approached by. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, somebody did answer, and I yelled for help, but she was at a distance. And um, in my opinion, she sounded like she was um, drunk Mm -hmm. herself. And she kept saying, you know, are you okay? And I was like, no, please call 911. I'm not. I've been shot. Please call 911. And then maybe four or five seconds later, a gentleman came up from behind me. I could hear him. I could barely see him. And he was asking me, Telling me I should give him my wallet in case the, the perps came back. And I, I give him wow, my wallet. really? For real. And he goes, No, I really think you should give me your wallet in case they come back. You don't want them to rip, rip you off. And I said, Man, get away from me. Wow. This time it started, it started to hurt. So they, I got the girl and she's closer and she said, I called 911. And he was like, I think you should give her your wallet. And then she started in, I think you should give me your wallet. And um, at that time, I heard the ambulance and they, they were gone. Astonishing, I I Atlanta. I didn't know that part of I didn't know that part of it at all. So so some helpful citizens tried to help you from getting robbed a second time by holding your wallet for you. That's very very considerate of them. Yes, I think very you know that's neighborly. Wow, uh, yeah, you know I I said I've said it before uh, in this space and I'll say it again. Uh, if you're dealing with a criminal element, you have to check your worldview at the door because they don't think like you think and they don't hold your values and they don't, they don't uh, value oh. life the same way that you do. So, uh, unbelievable. So, so do the ambulance or the p- police show up first? Oh, the ambulance. Okay. And they, so they move right in to help you without the police being there. Oh, uh, they're like sirens. I'm just going from me crashing the ground, you know, right. I'm starting start to feel pain at this point, really feeling it. And, um, it sounded like the ambulance was coming out from one side and then the police showing up. But the ambulance arrived first and then the police come up and wanting statements and such. And I was like, man, I've been shot. Right. You know, a black guy shot me. I don't know what you want me to say. Right. I mean, we get in the description. He had a hoodie and a mask on. Yeah, it doesn't get much more vague than that. So that so EMS tends to you. Um, I assume they take you to a, a hospital at this point. Um what uh, what's going through your head on the way to the hospital? You have to be thinking uh, things would be running through your head, well, like like uh, like things like uh, how am I going to get to work in the morning? You know, stuff like that. No, not at that point. Uh-huh. Um, like I said, I was that time I was in pain, and I was like, please just knock me out. <laughs> Honestly, that was what you know. Yeah, and then you know, I woke up in the hospital bed after surgery, and. So you wake up in the hospital, I'm sure it's a little disorienting and confusing. Did, did it take you a minute to realize where you were and what had happened? It did. Um, um, not to be graphic, but I had a catheter, you know, attached to me. And, Always you know, fun. The, uh, yeah, right. And uh, the IVs and such in my arm. And it didn't, you know, wasn't like, what am I doing here? 
you know, but I am still a little bit disoriented after, uh, you know, the drugs are pumping in. Sure. You know, for pain and such. And, uh, yeah, I see you nurses came in. Very wonderful people. So at some point, uh, I assume uniformed or detective law enforcement comes to see you to try to interview you at the hospital or no? No, sir. No. Okay. Were you? No, I got it. Go ahead. I got a phone call from the uh, officer, the deputy that was assigned my case, asking me for more information and left me her number in case I could think of anything. Okay. Yes. I'm hoping Atlanta. that I'm hoping there was more follow up than that. Mm, no, sir. You're kidding me. No, sir. I called her about the. Uh, was it about ten days? Not quite ten days, and I called her maybe seven or eight days to see if they had any um, follow up, you know, on the matter, anything that come of it. Because people were back in Florida were asking me, you know, hey, you know, that's a good question. And she said, no, our hands are tied. We can only go with what we see on the video, and it's pretty vague, and it could be anybody, and you know, like that's about all I can do. I don't remember I from, anything more. I don't remember from watching the video myself. Were, were they able to make out a license plate from the suspect's vehicle, or no? Well, clearly they couldn't. Um, I know I can see where, I guess, you know, for protection purposes, privacy purposes, they fuzzed out the my license plate. The vehicle, uh, the view of the vehicle was clear, but they had the uh, license plate fuzzed out so you couldn't make out the tag. And they had theirs as well. So Which, mine was crystal. I don't know why they couldn't have got theirs, but they didn't. Hmm. Have you heard uh, any more back from Atlanta Police Department about this or any any? It's no, follow- nothing. No, sir, it's a it's a closed case. I believe they didn't say that. Those are my words, but they haven't. They don't have any more information. How long were you in the hospital, Kevin? Uh, December eleventh till December twenty third. About twelve days. That's a long time. Quite a bit. <laughs> PT follow up that sort of thing. Uh, then I was going to uh, physical therapy here and. Orlando, um, where I live, and uh, I was gone twice a week till I was able to return to work. And uh, right now, I'm just dealing with uh, there's more metal in my leg now than there was after that bullet fragmented in my knee okay. because all the surgery. So I'm still trying to deal with you know that gets uh, ornery, if you will. Sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable. I'm, I just have to deal with that. I'm sure. What about medical bills? Uh, fortunately, um, my medical insurance covered it. Okay. That's good. All right. It's also, was so, it, was there any kind of victims advocacy, victim rights organization, a, anything like that that reached out to you to try to help? There was, it's a Georgia crime victims, uh, deal. And the gentleman that called me was really nice. Mm-hmm. And, um, he put me in touch with his boss and, um, uh, Let's just say I wish that I had been able to continue working with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, they um, they sent me out a bunch of paperwork I had to fill out and uh, asked me to send in any bills through a, a link that they had. And uh, but since insurance paid for everything, you know they haven't had any need to. Um, reimburse me for anything because I haven't had anything out of pocket, which is fortunate, you know, it's a blessing. So it's been about a, a year and a half since this happened. H- how are you now physically? How's your, how's your leg? How, how do you walk and all that sort of thing? Well, it's been about six months actually. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. It's still stiff as it was. It's 2022. Forgive me, Kevin. All good. I'm, I'm retired. Apologies. Dates mean nothing to me. <laughs> um, no, the thing is just, uh, my knee, doesn't bend. I can't, you know, kneel on my knees, um, um, on my right knee, mm-hmm. and uh, it's stiff. It's going to take a, it's going to take some effort. Eventually, I think I'll be. I don't think I'll be a hundred percent. I mean, I always look like you know something's wrong with my walking. Sure, but you know, I'm blessed. I I was able to walk again. I went through two very uh, well, I don't know what I'm looking for, but uh, critical surgeries. Mm-hmm. Because the first one, they, because it's completely 
did the trauma to the system. They couldn't do everything they needed to the first time. So they had to wait, you know, back off them and do a second surgery. I lost a lot of blood. Uh, a few days before I went to be released, I lost even more blood and had to have a transfusion. Um, I couldn't drive my car home. So I was kind of, well, how am I going to even get home? In the hospital, and the state wanted to put me into, um, I think this is noteworthy, forgive me, into a, a, kind of a managed care facility, into a semi private room that also uh, allowed the indigent to come and stay. Mm. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to wake up one morning, all my stuff's gone because right. the homeless come and took it. So, fortunately, um, and this is a real blessing, people from my church back in Florida called me and made arrangements with me. Two men of them came up there. One drove me back in his truck and the other one drove my car home. Where, it was just amazing. Just amazing. That is that is good stuff. Where was your car in the interim? They impounded it? They impounded it. <laughs> in a tow lot that was charging me through the nose. Please tell me you didn't have to pay for that. I did. You're kidding me. I did. I called the police and was like, can you guys help me out on this? And they were like, that's where we tow the vehicles. You know, that's our... <sighs> Oh yeah, four hundred and some dollars. Keep my car there for seven days, and since I I had to arrange with the people I was staying with in the bed and breakfast before the day before they left to come back to Florida, came into the hospital, got my keys, went to the tow lot, and to deal with those colorful people, uh, they weren't very nice at all, mm-hmm. and uh, get my car. So you know, it was a lot of blessings. I had, you know, I had just met these two guys and we were like brothers right away. But it was great. And the church helped me out. So a lot of blessings came out of this, honestly. It's good to know. So uh, I always I always like to ask, um, and this is not something you have to answer if you don't want to, if it's sensitive or whatever, I totally understand. Uh, talk to us about any kind of post-traumatic stress you may have suffered. Has anything like that occurred yet or or uh, or no? Not yet. Um, I'm very careful to... Um, try to know everything I do locally where I know, you know, people or, you know, don't go into a strange area. I, I, I say I live in Orlando. I live in the metropolitan area and there's bad areas in Orlando. Of course there is everywhere, mm-hmm. you know, so if I'm, if I need gas or something and I'm stuck in a bad area, I'm probably going to change <laughs> until I get, you know, someplace safe feeling for, you know, um, Attempt to get gas. Hmm. And then, like I said, I keep questioning myself. What if I've done things differently? What if I've done things differently? But I've talked to some friends here in my church that were former police officers, and they said the same thing. The gentleman, the officers in uh, Atlanta said that, uh, you know, there's a good chance it would have happened anyway, that they would have been a follow through of some sort. That, or what if I gave my keys and they shot me anyway? Then I'll be without a car too. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough one. Um, we talk about it a lot on uh, on the main channel. John does more than I do because I generally cover police badge cams, dash cams because I'm retired LE, and John does more of the regular um, like surveillance video, like your case for example. And it's 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 a question that uh, for me. I, I've been a victim of violent crime. It was, it's been a long time, but I, when I was in high school, I managed a movie theater. Fortunately, I wasn't shot, but I had a gun pointed in my face. Um, and I feigned compliance and was able to get to throw the guy a couple of bucks and get my employees out of there and get a door locked in between him and I. But, wow, you know, in, awesome. in that moment, you're always, you know, you always have to make a decision. Am I going to comply or, or not comply? I, I think the key thing is if whatever you end up doing, do it a hundred percent. Um, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to comply, just comply and, and hope for the best. But, you know, as you know, I'm sure, you know, compliance is not necessarily equal mercy on the part of the criminal. I mean, they, they may still yes. shoot you True. just to shoot you because, you know, life is cheap. You know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, in my mind, I'm going to imagine this kid was young and scared and really, really, really didn't want to kill you. And that's why he, that's why he put the gun right up to your leg in hopes of not actually taking your life. I don't know why it makes me feel better about the world. I've seen a lot of bad stuff. Um, yeah, that's. It could have gone differently in a whole bunch of different ways, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so if, uh, if you're back in that situation, we're talking about doing things differently. If if you're back there now, 2020 hindsight, knowing what you know now, uh, what, what do you do differently? Well, 
I think yeah, I'd like to believe that I would have just waited on the gasoline, or maybe gone you know, back and uh, to the big B and say, "Hey guys, I need gas." You know, um, he said, "Knowing what I know now," and saying, "Could you guys, you know, go with me, follow me down to get gas?" So I got to be at work at six earlier than you guys do, and uh, you know, just because I don't think I have time to do it in the morning, and I'm certain I would have been okay with them. I'm not really one to reach out and ask people to do things for me that I think I should be able to do for myself. Mm -hmm. So So let's say you, 2020 hindsight, you do go to the place and you are presented with a situation where this young man points a gun at you and demands your keys. Uh, Do you, do you give him the keys now knowing what you know, or do you do something differently? No, I give him my key. I give him the keys. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of what I was after. Um, I'll tell you, it's it's very easy for uh, you know you'll you'll uh, once the video goes on the channel, if you look at it, don't read the comments. Whatever you do, just avoid the comment section with with all all of your might and being because the comment section will um, well they will be uh, four thousand eight hundred and thirty four people who know exactly what you should have done in that situation, who weren't in that situation, you me. were. <clears throat> you know, um, my mom, my brother, my sister, all you know. Oh, why didn't you just give my keys? Mm-hmm. My sister's bawling her head off, and she basically is saying everything. But you're stupid <laughs> for not giving him the keys. The you know, only thing I could say to her is like, you're thinking, you know, like, you know, you weren't there. It wasn't your situation, right? Right, and that's that. That is the case. Kevin, anything else you wanted to add before we part ways, sir? Well, uh, I'd like to say I said it on the video uh, from the um, on the Fox News. You know, just People go someplace. I don't care where you are, um, what color your skin is, what your nationality is. You know, uh, just be careful. You know, be alert. Be your, alert your situation. That could be, that could have happened in the daytime. You know, it could happen anywhere. It's just it's a different world out there, and you know, people need to be alert of their surroundings and gauge. You know, gauge your surroundings where you can get out of your vehicle. If somebody pulls up on their side of the pump from you, be aware of it. Hmm. Be aware of it. Absolutely. You, know, you think, oh, it's, you know, it's not my business. Make it your business. Absolutely. That's a great way to end. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks, sir. It's been awesome. I appreciate you reaching out to me. And, um, yeah, I hope this helps somebody else going forward to making better decisions than I made. <laughs> God willing. Thanks, Kevin. All right, brother. Take care. So God bless you and your family. Be safe. You too. Bye-bye. Alrighty, folks, it's that time of the week again. It is time for the Gutowski Files featuring, starring Stephen Gutowski. He is the founder of TheReload.com and the host of the Weekly Reload podcast. Stephen, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. So this week, uh, once again, unfortunately, another just very somber and depressing thing to talk about, um, but it is it is what's going on. Uh, the attack on July 4th uh, in Highland Park, Illinois, was just unbelievably awful and unspeakable. And, uh, of course, you know, we, we, unfortunately, this is something I want to talk about too. Unfortunately, there is no tragedy so awful that we, we can't immediately go to our independent sides and start hurling, um, political tropes at one another instead of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, grieving as a nation, at least for a day or two. It's almost instantaneous now that people start, they pick their sides and start hurling accusations at the other side. With that said, uh, there is an article at the Reload about the uh, Democrats in Congress, basically saying that um, you know that the recent legislation that they passed uh, doesn't go far enough in light of this new shooting. So, Steve, do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, and you know, certainly, like you said, it's a horrific incident. Uh, you know, and, and it's understandable people are are tired of hearing these things, watching these things happen. It's, it's terrible. It's fatiguing. It's it's monstrous, but, um, but yeah, so obviously we talked just recently about the new federal gun law that was passed, the first new gun restrictions in, in decades, really. Um, and to be fair, it was, uh, it was a compromise bill between Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. And, uh, the Democrats had been saying while, you know, during the passage of that bill that they didn't think it was it wasn't what they really wanted and wasn't as far as they wanted to go because uh, uh you know it didn't have some of the big ticket items that they they've been pushing for for a long time but yes and so after this the july 4th shooting you had 
a lot of prominent Democrats saying, uh, you know, effectively that the, the new law is insufficient and that more needs to be done. You had, uh, for instance, Sam, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth, who's a Democrat from Illinois, uh, said uh, last month Congress proved that bipartisan compromises on gun safety are possible. Today proved that we can't stop there. She said that, you know, obviously on the day of the shooting. Um, and you had Senator Chris Murphy from Massachusetts, who was one of the leaders of that bipartisan negotiation. And he said, uh, quote, we have now broken the back of the gun lobby. We now have made possible changes in our gun laws that can keep our community safer. Today is a reminder that we still have a long road to travel. He called the bill or the new law uh, only the beginning. So, uh, you know, this is obviously in line with what a lot of uh, gun rights advocates had cautioned about that this was going to be the case. And, you know, again, to be fair to the Democrats, they weren't, they weren't shy about the idea that they uh, didn't want to stop at the, the new bipartisan bill. But, but uh, yeah, certainly that's come to pass now. Well, I mean, if you think about it, either side of the aisle uh, isn't, isn't really going to be completely happy with any legislation unless it gets all of their possible goals, you know, achieved. So, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's just true across the board, I think. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about what happened in Highland Park to, to say if um, this or that red flag or restriction would have done anything about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can say that uh, I, part of me definitely feels, and this is me editorializing now, part of me definitely feels like uh, if the gun laws weren't what they were in that particular state, in that particular region, perhaps, maybe, there might have been some armed resistance to this guy. That's you know, obviously conjecture on my part, but uh, so often you see these situations where there's a public setting and there's just no one there that's in a, in a position to defend against someone um, who shows up to, to prey on, on innocent people. Um, yeah. I think this particular incident, because he was shooting from an elevated position into a crowd, you know, similar to what happened in Las Vegas, right. uh, it's difficult for anyone to stop that from the ground, of course. Um and so, you know, sometimes there's just no easy solutions. I will say, obviously, to go the other way, uh, the main call that these Democrats have put out is for an assault weapons ban, uh, you know, banning AR-15s and, and similar firearms. We don't know exactly what gun this guy used, but it was some sort of rifle that has been reported to be similar to an AR-15. So I, I don't we, we don't know exactly what that means, especially given how media talks about guns. They often don't know what they're what they're saying or what they're looking at and trying to identify. But uh, this, this County where this happened, Lake County uh, in Illinois does have a, uh, or this, this city Highland park uh, does have an assault winds ban already. So uh, they also have red flag laws. Um, You know, so there it's similar to the Buffalo shooting where, you know, a lot of the proposed policies to address it are already in place in Buffalo, New York and did not obviously stop that shooting either. So uh, it's one of those things where sometimes it's, there's not going to be some instantaneous, simple solution to these, these things. Uh, obviously this shooter, like many of these other shooters we've talked about had severe uh, mental health issues and had made threats in the past uh, and had been in contact with the police. Uh, although it's much easier to, um, to, to notice that connection in hindsight, of course, uh, that it is at the time that something is happening and these are things spread over years. Uh, but yeah, either way, no, but he was never uh, convicted of any serious crime. He was never um, subject to a red flag order in, in Illinois, uh, even though there was available there. Uh, and so he was able to obtain his guns legally, apparently, from the reporting. Um, he had a firearm owner identification card, which is a Basically, as a purchase uh, permit in Illinois, you have to go to get a special permit to buy guns, uh, not just to carry them. Uh, and he had that permit. So uh, Illinois has some of the strictest gun laws in the country uh, already. And um, it's not the strictest, but, you know, it's among the strictest. And so uh, it's not as though there's a simple solution, I think, uh, whether it's on either end, you know, uh, because, again, he he had planned this attack out. He climbed up to the roof of a building, shot into a crowd and he was done shooting and 
I don't know, a minute. And, it, you know, even though there were armed police officers there, it's very difficult to stop something like that. And apparently, in this case, it was even hard to find him after he'd committed the attack. So he was able to, uh, I guess he dressed up like a woman to hide his tattoos and, and identifying features and then left with the crowd. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of challenges to these things, unfortunately. It's, it's a very difficult situation. Yeah, you know, I would really like to, uh, I know um, certain outlets, uh, they, they never name these shooters. They never show their picture. They never, uh, you know, show their manifesto or whatever other nonsense that they've uh, drummed up in the basement of their mom's house. Um, they just don't glorify, you know, not, not that the, the outlets that do show this stuff are trying to glorify, quote unquote, but it is pretty gross the way they show their, like this kid had a music video and all sorts of stuff. They show it over and over and over again. And for me, that's just the next shooter is just watching that sitting there thinking about how I can get a higher body count about how I can be famous or infamous. Even if I die, at least, you know, all the people that picked on me will know my name, whatever. Uh, I, I would, I would really like to see that the mainstream media all the media stop showing their pictures you know the only people that need to know who he was really in my opinion are the investigators